Hello everyone. Today's lesson is going to cover two chapters from your textbook. First of all, we'll be talking about the immune system specifically of humans, uh, but this is uh, fairly reflective of how other animals protect their bodies from invaders as well. Uh, we'll specifically talk about uh, the innate versus adaptive immune system and how each of these uh, provides protection uh, of the body's tissues from invaders. Uh, then we will talk specifically about viruses. Um, you know, what is a virus uh, structurally, and then we'll talk about some um, different strategies they have and advantages. Um, and then, of course, we'll talk a little bit about um, a couple example viruses. The human immune system is divided into the innate and the adaptive immune system. The word innate should imply to you that this is something that you're born with. It's not something that you need to develop over time. These mechanisms are in place literally from the first moment you are born. Um, the innate immune system encompasses a couple different uh, strategies, a couple different um, what are called lines of defense. Uh, first of all, our body tries very hard to keep invaders out in the first place. Right? We don't want to fight them if they don't make it into our body in the first place. And so the first line of defense in our body really is um, maintaining these surface barriers. Right? So what you can see up here is a, an epithelium right, with underlying connective tissue down here. Uh, we've talked about the epithelium um, in the respiratory system and the digestive system, um, well, we've said that these cells are tightly sewn together right, by what are called tight junctions. And so invaders, in theory, cannot make their way through or in between these cells into the underlying tissues. Um, but of course, we have a lot of other uh, mechanisms in place for keeping invaders out uh, besides just these tight junctions and very selectively permeable epithelial cells. Um, a lot of the epithelia in our body are actually covered by mucus, right? So this might seem a little weird. How is mucus protective? Um, well, invaders, um, such as you know bacteria, viruses, whatever, particles even, um, cannot even get to the epithelium itself because of this very thick, viscous mucus. And so this mucus um, lines our entire digestive and respiratory tract. Remember that um, air, food, drink comes into our body, but it's not actually in our body uh, right away. Um, and so this mucus actually uh, helps to protect that, um, protect the epithelial lining. Um, also, uh, our specialized cells and our glands actually secrete some specialized compounds to repel invaders. Um, so for example, your sweat glands are constantly secreting antimicrobial proteins onto the surface of your skin. Um, and so this helps to maintain this very delicate balance of, you know, quote unquote, good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. Um, we want to wash away the bacteria um, that would be trying to invade us in a negative way. Okay. Um, so, uh, first line of defense is just keeping things out. Okay. Um, what we also have as part of this first line of defense um, is a group of cells called natural killer cells um, that are pretty much just patrolling your tissues constantly. All right. So they're going to be kind of weaving in and out of the cells within your body and checking to make sure that any cell that's in your body actually belongs to you, right? It has your genome, your characteristics. It's not a foreign substance. And so the way that these natural killer cells do this is they look for something called an MHC, right? A major histocompatibility complex, which is coded for by your genes, right? So all of the cells in your body express um, some MHC or other. Um, and when natural killer cells are you know, kind of patrolling your your tissues, um, they make sure that the MHC, the major histocompatibility complex, is right, right? This is my cell. It has my cellular fingerprint expressed on the surface. Um, if um, there is an invading cell, if uh, there are mutations in your cells, right, so potentially leading to cancer, um, the MHC is not going to be expressed in a way that the natural killer cells recognize. Um, so that's what you can see over here. Um, there is no recognizable MHC, and this signals the natural killer cells 
um, to release uh, a couple chemicals that actually essentially poke holes in these abnormal cells, whether they're cancerous personal cells, our own self cells, or they're an invader. Um, essentially, once the holes are poked, um, the cell contents leak out or they lice and the cell then dies. Okay, so these natural killer cells um, are also part of our first line of defense, making sure that our tissues themselves are healthy. If there is a breach in this barrier, right, in any of these surface barriers, whether you're talking about your skin, as we can see in this image, um, or if uh, there is some kind of invasion or leakiness um, out of your gut, um, if you breathe in some kind of uh, pathogen and that pathogen happens to cross over your respiratory membrane and actually make it into your blood, um, we also have a second line of defense, right? So when things actually get into our body, as we can see here, this splinter is breaking through this first line of defense, this epithelial barrier, and allowing the entrance of, um, in this case, uh, bacteria. And so what, uh, what is our body's next line of defense against these invaders? Um, well, first of all, um, the cells within the infected tissue Right, so just mast cells and macrophages, um, these cells are going to release chemical signals um, in the cytokine family. Okay, so there's a lot of different cytokines, um, but in general, these chemicals are released um, and they are essentially um, signaling other types of immune cells to arrive at the scene as quickly as physically possible and start attacking all of these invaders. And so that's what we see next. Um, uh, so again, these cytokines are going to call over other white blood cells. In this next image, we see um, that the blood vessels become a little bit leakier so that white blood cells, in this case neutrophils, can squeeze in between the endothelial lining of the blood vessel and they can enter the tissues. And so, of course, once they're in the tissues, these neutrophils can then phagocytose um, or, you know, actually engulf or eat these bacteria, um, therefore killing them, eliminating them um, from our tissues. Okay, the very first uh, phagocytes, so these uh, professional eating cells to arrive, are the neutrophils, and these kind of are the, the front lines of the army. Um, they can consume one bacteria, one virus, one um, protist, whatever is uh, invading your body, they can consume one of these and then they die. And so um, if you are actively fighting an infection um, of this you know, splinter here, um, often what happens is um, you see pus start to develop. And so what pus actually is, is a bunch of dead neutrophils that have each consumed one of these invading pathogens and then they die. Um, and then they have to be kind of washed away as pus. Okay, so um, again, when there is a breach in this first line of defense in these surface barriers, surrounding cells release cytokines. These cytokines call other white blood cells or uh, phagocytes to the scene so that they can start to clean up the area. Okay, and so all the way over here, we can see uh, phagocytosis is occurring abundantly. Um, also, cytokines are going to lead to, um, or are going to cause the inflammatory process, right? So when you do get cut, um, you can feel that your uh, skin in that area is a lot warmer, right? Essentially, we send a lot more blood to an area that is trying to heal, that's trying to fight an infection, um, so that we can deliver these extra phagocytes, right? So that extra warmth, that extra redness, um, that extra kind of puffiness um, is inflammation, and that's actually a really important part of our defense mechanisms. Right, of course, when it uh, when it gets out of hand, it can cause other problems, but we'll get into that later. Right, um, and finally, if you um, are also right trying to uh, fight um, an infection, one um, additional symptom might be a fever. Right, so a fever is um, essentially uh, your body uh, releasing chemicals to kind of trick your hypothalamus, right, part of your brain, into increasing your body temperature. And so what's going on here is that um, an increase in body temperature is going to A, allow more blood flow uh, more quickly, 
right? and therefore delivering these uh, innate immune system cells throughout the body to defend it everywhere. Um, also, a lot of pathogens are less functional at a higher body temperature. Right? So some of their proteins might start to unravel or denature. Um, and uh, this makes it easier, of course, to phagocytose them and eliminate them from the body. Um, and finally, uh, some of our our personal immune system cells function best or more efficiently at a higher temperature. And so this is um, suppressing the invader and enhancing the activity of our cells. And so um, you might have heard that, you know, it kind of goes back and forth um, once in a while, but you can, uh, you've probably heard that if you have a fever, you shouldn't take medicine to suppress that fever unless it is um, getting dangerously high. Um, and the reason for that is that um, a fever um, is actually a good process, a helpful process in defending your body. So all of the mechanisms that I've talked about so far are just generic for anything, bacteria, virus, protist, whatever is trying to invade your body. Um, there are some specific uh, responses, even as part of your innate immune system, um, towards particular uh, biological entities. Um, and so we're at, what I'm getting at here is um, our innate immune system includes chemicals called interferons. And so these interferons are released by uh, our cells that are infected by viruses. And so um, what we can see up here in the top right is that when a virus infects one of our healthy cells, what that's going to do is it's going to activate a gene within the genome of that infected cell. And so this gene is always there, um, but um, as we've talked about many times before, genes can be turned on and expressed, therefore transcribed, translated, and then used as a protein, um, or they're not. And so um, it's kind of expensive to make this protein all the time, and so we only make this interferon protein when um, our cells become infected by a virus. Right? So the infected cell essentially releases a lot of this protein right? as the virus is doing its thing, which we'll get into later, um, but it releases this protein to warn neighboring cells that, hey, there's going to be viruses coming, um, you need to ramp up your defenses. Okay, and so what exactly does um, the receiving cell uh, do? Well, this image down here is going to, or it summarizes a lot of the different types of genes um, that are turned on in response to this interferon message. And uh, the actual uh, proteins aren't uh, important for us to know at this point, but I just want to point out that um, interferon can communicate um, essentially what type of virus, uh, whether it's RNA or DNA viruses, and um, you know, depending on the type of virus, that will turn on different sets of genes. All right, so over here um, are different genes that are turned on by interferon. And as we can see, um, there are um, kind of different strategies that are, uh, or, you know, kind of different mechanisms that we can take to undermine the activity of the virus. All right, and again, we'll get into a lot of these things later, but. Um, you know, the cells are pretty much just throwing out everything they possibly can to defend themselves from invasion. Okay, so to summarize the innate immune system, um, we can see over here in the image to the right that uh, the innate immune system has a lot of different um, kind of different mechanisms um, that are part of it. Uh, first of all, we prevent invasion in the first place, right? We maintain a healthy epithelium. Um, our skin, our epithelial linings of our respiratory, digestive, urinary, reproductive tracts, all of these different um, organ systems allow invaders right, to be within our body, but as long as we maintain these physical barriers, the invaders don't actually infect our tissues. Right? The innate immune system um, has a lot of different um, phagocytes, Right, so these are all pretty much derived from white blood cells. They circulate in the blood. Um, they patrol our tissues. They're pretty much looking for anything that doesn't quite belong. Um, 
Specifically, we have natural killer cells, which are always completing what's called immune surveillance, right? making sure that all of the cells in our body our, are our cells. Right? They express our MHCs on the surface and therefore they can stay. Okay. Uh, we have interferons uh, to fight against viruses, but these are only produced after a virus has already infected our cells. Um, the complement system, I didn't really talk about too much, but um, complement system is um, essentially a chain reaction of different molecules within your blood um, that essentially um, increases um, the attack on anything weird. Okay. Um, the inflammatory response is triggered uh, by cytokines, right, very much associated with the complement system, um, but this essentially increases the flow of blood and the delivery of uh, phagocytes to an infected area. Um, and finally, a fever is important for um, suppressing the invader and increasing the activity of our cells. Okay, and so um, ultimately all of these different types of um, all of these different mechanisms within the innate immune system aren't specific right they don't uh, really distinguish between you know this is an e coli versus this is a staphylococcus versus this is this um, everything is pretty much attacked in largely the same way um, it's pretty much using um, a sledgehammer, right? Just going through and like beating away anything that doesn't look like us. Um, regardless of what's invading, we have the same types of response. We have neutrophils arriving at the seam first, phagocytosing, and then all of these other cells start to roll in. Um, natural killer cells always uh, completing surveillance and so on and so forth. So this is the same no matter what. Um, again, this is present at birth. Right? It's not something that we develop over time, um, and it's not something that we can um, kind of train over time. It's going to work the same way no matter what. Um, and finally, this is generally a local response. Right? When I say local response, I mean um, these cells are arriving at the scene of infection. It is not something that your entire body is doing. Um, if you have a cut on your finger, you're not going to have inflammation in your foot, right? So this is localized, it is not specific, but it is something that starts up right away, right? As soon as the invasion occurs and we know it, um, the innate immune system is going to be there and beating everything away that doesn't belong. The adaptive immune system, in contrast to the innate immune system, launches specific attacks on specific pathogens. Right? Generally, that has to be um, this part of the immune system has to be trained. It has to be exposed to something um, specific, recognize what it is, and then launch an attack. Right? So instead of just going forth and like using a sledgehammer against everything, this is patrolling um, not only the site of infection, right? so the splinter in your finger, um, but the entire body um, is kind of put on alert and these cells go all throughout the body making sure that the bacteria that invaded in your finger isn't now in your foot. And so um, how exactly does this work? Um, during the innate immune system response to an invasion, right? So you get a splinter in your finger. Some of those phagocytes are specialized, what are called antigen presenting cells, right? So what we can see um, down here is um, the skin, right? The epidermis um, has been breached by some kind of antigen, right? So some kind of invader cells in the skin in that area are going to phagocytose, right? so they're going to engulf whatever that pathogen is, and their job then isn't just to digest it and get rid of it, it is to alert the adaptive immune system to the presence of this particular antigen. And so um, we have seen a couple of um, structures before that essentially um, house uh, immune cells. Um, they are right under the surface barriers, right? So they are right in the places um, where invasion is most likely to occur, right? So for example, um, we have a lot of 
uh, immune system or lymphatic tissue um, that surrounds our nasal cavity and our oral cavity, right? So we are literally taking things into our body in these places. And so we want to make sure that if any of those things try to cross over the epithelium, we have cells right there ready to phagocytose and launch an immune response. Um, we also have, um, see, we talked about this uh, in the last lesson, but we have GALT, right? So we have um, this lymphatic tissue just deep to the epithelium lining the entire uh, digestive tract. Um, again, this is for housing these specialized cells so that we can launch an immune response right away. Right. Um, also, um, there is similar tissue within our lungs called BALT, right, or bronchi associated lymphatic tissue. Right. So again, all of these different structures are just um, more or less just deep to the epithelial lining. Right? And so as soon as a pathogen enters into the body and tries to breach this barrier, they are going to confront these immune cells right away. Right? So what happens when these phagocytes or these specialized antigen presenting cells engulf one of these pathogens? The next thing they have to do is they have to essentially present the pathogen to a specialized adaptive immune system cell. So these are the T and B lymphocytes or T and B cells. Um, essentially what's going to happen here is that the antigen presenting cell with its um, pathogen enclosed is going to be sucked up into a lymphatic vessel. We talked about these a little bit before as well. Um, here we see a capillary bed bringing oxygenated blood to the tissues, draining out deoxygenated blood. Uh, at these blood capillary beds, there are also lymphatic vessels um, sucking up any of the extra fluid from the tissues, but also they are super permeable and so they suck up these APCs as well. And so uh, through these lymphatic vessels, um, essentially there's this kind of milking action, pushing up this fluid to be filtered through a series of lymph nodes, through our tonsils, our spleen, um, all of these different lymphatic organs um, are going to filter the fluid. And so what exactly is happening in these filters? Well, those antigen presenting cells, which just engulfed or phagocytosed one of those pathogens um, is going to you know essentially um, take the pathogen into the cell while it's being milked up to the lymph nodes it is going to chop up that pathogen and then put tiny pieces of the pathogen onto the surface of the antigen presenting cell and when it's in the lymph node it is going to show that pathogen, that piece, hey, you know, this bacteria looks like this on the outside. It is going to show that bacteria to a T cell or a B cell. Right? So these are both white blood cells that are very specific. They are part of the adaptive immune system. Okay. So once an antigen presenting cell has pretty much you know, played show and tell um, with whatever it has just found in your finger after you got a paper cut or a splinter. Um, next, what's going to happen is the activation of specific T cells or B cells. Right? So these are two um, kind of subdivisions of the adaptive immune system, our cellular immunity, the T cells, and the humoral immunity, the B cells. Um, that's beyond the scope of this class. Um, but what I want to point out is that um, Certain T cells, um, once they recognize, hey, this bacteria is invading the body, they are going to replicate, making more and more and more of these T cells that recognize this specific bacteria. And all of those new T cells are going to enter the bloodstream and they are going to patrol the entire body, making sure that this bacteria isn't spreading um, to our more peripheral tissues. Okay. Um, also, the B cells, right? So the B cells, um, they have what are called antibodies on the surface of their cell. Um, each of these antibodies is a protein coded for by our own genes, right? And so these are capable of recognizing specific antigens or specific pieces of um, invaders, okay? So for the most part, um, you know, we have 
you know, millions of uh, possibilities of uh, different molecules that we can recognize with these antibodies, but we don't want to produce um, B cells and antibodies for all of those things. And so when the antigen presenting cell presents a particular antigen, right, to this B cell here, only this lineage of B cells is going to be activated and start launching an immune response. And so what's going to happen is that this cell is going to produce clones of itself. All right, so it's going to undergo mitosis after mitosis after mitosis, producing tons of these cells, um, which are, of course, equipped with the particular antibodies that recognize the particular thing that we're trying to fight. This particular thing has been found in the body before, we need to attack it now. And so um, how exactly do these B cells um, act against the invaders? Well, they are going to produce um, lots of what are called plasma cells. And so these plasma cells look a little bit different um, than the initial cells, but they are um, genetically the same. They are going to start pumping out free antibodies, right? So now they're not uh, on the surface of the cells anymore. Now they're just being pumped out into the blood. Um, and so these antibodies are the same as these antibodies over here, which can recognize this specific antigen, right? The invader that's actually in the body now. Um, and so these guys can pump out thousands of these antibodies every second, um, filling the blood um, with these tiny little proteins. Okay. Um, also, um, some of those clones are called memory B cells, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, but first, let's look at the action of antibodies themselves. Okay. The first point I want to make here is that antibodies do not kill anything. Right? Antibodies themselves are not lethal in any way. Um, instead, antibodies um, essentially uh, act in these ways. Um, first of all, they are going to neutralize the pathogen. And so what we see down here is actually a virus which is being coded by these antibodies, right? The antibodies that are specifically able to recognize this invader in particular. Um, essentially, one of the ways, um, or the way um, that bacteria and viruses can actually affect our body's tissues is by sticking to those tissues in a variety of ways. We'll get into that um, by sticking to our tissues and therefore um, being able to go inside our cells or attack the cells from the outside, etc. Um, the virus in this case cannot latch on to our cells and therefore um, invade our cells if it has this nice little coating of antibodies around it. Right? So we literally prevent um, the invader from actually invading our cells by putting a shell around it. Um, also, uh, what we can do is we can um, group a lot of these um, pathogens uh, together um, with the same antibody and essentially forming little clumps. Um, these clumps are, of course, heavier than the surrounding um, you know, for example, blood. Um, and so they are going to precipitate out of the bloodstream and therefore um, become immobile and become a lot easier of a target for, oops, sorry, for things like phagocytosis, right? So again, um, it's a lot easier to eat, right, to get rid of these pathogens if they are clumped together and not floating around in the blood um, unregulated. Okay. Um, also, antibodies are going to enhance the inflammatory response. Right? So the inflammatory response, remember, um, is increasing blood flow. It is increasing the number of white blood cells that arrive at the scene and phagocytose the invaders. Right? Uh, finally, um, it is going to fix and activate complement. Right? So part of this chain reaction um, of events that's occurring in the blood involves the insertion um, of what are called membrane attack complexes or MECs. Um, essentially, these are proteins that get poked into the membrane of the invading uh, or of the invader um, and allow all of the cell contents 
to leak out, thus cell lysis. Um, so uh, antibodies essentially um, mark these invaders for destruction, right? So it's essentially like planting little flags on the surface of these guys. Hey, membrane attack complexes, insert over here so that we can kill these things. Okay, so again, antibodies are not killing pathogens, but they are greatly increasing the chances of the pathogens being killed. Um, and so everything I've been talking about so far is the primary immune response. So this is the first time you are exposed to something. Um, and so your initial exposure over here. Remember that in order for antibodies to be produced to you know, flag pathogens for destruction, for neutralizing them, for pretty much making sure our body gets rid of these things. Um, what has to happen is an antigen presenting cell phagocytoses the pathogen, chops it up, finds its way to a B cell, shows the pathogen to the B cell. That B cell clones itself, and those clones finally end up producing the antibodies, right? And then the antibodies circulate around and they do what they do. Um, so all of that stuff takes time, right? So here is when you're exposed. Here's when you get the, the splinter to the, uh, in the first place. And for days, you don't have any antibody. Right, so Y axis here is the concentration of antibody in your blood. Um, you don't have any of these antibodies in your blood actually working to combat the pathogen. And so um, only after a few days, you get an increase in the number of uh, antibodies. You fight the thing and then the antibodies, the antibody concentration goes back down again. We don't need that much all the time. Um, and so um, your adaptive immune system only, right? Not your innate, your innate just like hits everything away. Um, your adaptive immune system maintains some of these what are called memory cells within your body, right? So within your lymphatic tissue circulating around in your blood. Um, and so these memory cells literally remember what they have seen before. Right? They still have these antibodies on the surface of them that recognize this particular thing and this particular thing only. And so the next time you get a paper cut or you get a splinter and that same pathogen invades your body, now we don't have to go through this entire process, right? the phagocytosis, the presenting, the cloning, the antibody production, all of that stuff isn't necessary because now we have memory B cells that are already there and they can immediately make more plasma cells to pump out more antibodies. And so what we see the second time we're exposed to something or this secondary immune response is that there is no delay, right? We don't have to wait days for antibodies to show up. We already have some, right? And those memory B cells can immediately start pumping out antibodies, right? So the second time you are exposed to something, the same thing, you get a faster and stronger response to that particular pathogen, right? So ideally being exposed um, to a lot of different pathogens, a lot of different things um, is going to enhance your immunity. You're going to be quote unquote immune to more things. And so now what I want to do is show you a clip um, from a crash course video um, talking about uh, the adaptive immune system and specifically the humoral immunity or the B cells and antibodies. Um, and what he's going to talk to you about are uh, essentially the methods of actually acquiring this immunity. So actually forming these memory cells so that you can launch a stronger faster response the next time you're exposed to things.
the long term, this process also adds to your overall immunity. The humoral response allows your body to achieve immunity by encountering pathogens either randomly or on purpose. Active humoral immunity is what we were just talking about. It's when B cells bump into antigens and start cranking out antibodies. This can occur naturally, like when you catch the flu or get chicken pox or pick up some nasty bacterial infection, or it can happen artificially, particularly through vaccination. Most vaccines are made of a dead or extremely weakened pathogen, and they work on the premise that because a secondary immune response is more intense than a primary response, by introducing a pathogen into your body, you're priming it to fight hard and fast should that antigen show up again. In the case of typically non-fatal infections like the common flu, this immunity should at least spare you from some of the most severe symptoms. But in the case of more serious diseases like polio, smallpox, measles, and whooping cough, vaccinations can be truly life-saving. Now, some antigens, like those from mumps or measles, don't really change much over time, so a few immunizations will leave you set for life. But others, like influenza, are constantly evolving and changing their surface antigens, so immunity to last year's flu probably doesn't work against this year's flu. Still, acquired immunity doesn't have to be active. Babies, for example, naturally obtain passive humoral immunity while still in the womb. They receive ready-made antibodies from their mothers through the placenta and later on through breast milk. And that works pretty well for a few months, but the protection is temporary because passively obtained antibodies don't live long in their new body, and they can't produce effector cells or memory cells, so a baby's own system won't remember an antigen if it gets infected again. You can also acquire this kind of temporary passive immunity artificially by receiving exogenous antibodies from the plasma of an immune donor. This is what recently saved some doctors and nurses who had contracted the Ebola virus from infected patients. A serum was made from the blood plasma of other medical workers who had been infected and survived. The antibodies helped defend the patients from the virus before their own active immunity could identify that particular antigen and start creating their own antibodies. It's not the same as a vaccine, which immediately engages your B cells, but it can buy a patient some crucial, life-saving time against an infection that would otherwise quickly kill. But to summarize, a vaccination or an immunization is essentially when scientists can take a piece of a pathogen, right, or a dead part of, or a dead pathogen or otherwise um, inactive pathogen, inject it beyond these surface barriers and therefore expose the body right to these um, pieces of pathogen um, and essentially um, the antigen presenting cells will phagocytose these dead pieces right so they're not actually making you sick they're not actually invading your cells they just look like the pathogen um, they're going to show them to your b cells right your b cells are going to produce antibodies, they're going to produce memory cells, so that when you are exposed to the real thing, so the live virulent strain of these um, of these pathogens, you can launch a quick, strong response against them. And oftentimes that is the difference we need, right? So that is um, the difference between life and death. And so what I have here is um, a case study uh, from a couple years ago um, so from 2016 or so, um, this is from Scientific American, or so, sorry, this is from uh, National Geographic actually. Um, so what it's showing you here is a couple different types of um, illnesses, right? So here is rubella, mumps, hepatitis A and B, uh, the chicken pox, right? Uh, diphtheria, pertussis, and polio. And so um, what these red circles are showing you is the abundance of people um, who have contracted these illnesses since the 1940s. And so you can see like big um, outbreaks of the measles, um, <clears throat> right, big outbreaks of pertussis and so on and so forth. Um, and then the next thing, um, this little black dot here, is when the vaccine for these particular illnesses has been developed. So again, injecting just a piece of uh, of the pathogen, not alive, um, under the surface barrier, so under the skin, um, therefore teaching your uh, humoral immunity, right? Teaching your B cells that this is not good. Develop memory cells so that you can launch an attack later. 
Um, and so after the vaccine is developed, what we can see is a sharp decline and in often cases um, an eradication of the illness, right? So the more people that are immune to it, right, that have built up antibodies themselves, um, the less this, um, these viruses, these bacteria can actually be spread from person to person, right? And therefore the disease is more or less eliminated by these vaccines. Okay, and so um, one more thing that I want to point out is that um, we are starting to see these diseases come back. Right. So a lot of these are fatal. A lot of these can produce lifelong impacts. For example, um, they can cause deafness. They can um, destroy your respiratory system. Um, and so we're starting to see these illnesses come back because of um, misinformation being spread about vaccines and what they are. Um, really, a vaccine is just dead pieces of these illnesses injected so that you yourself can train your immune system to attack them. Okay, so shifting gears just a little bit now um, into chapter 33, talking about viruses. Okay, so viruses um, are not technically considered to be alive. Um, and so earlier this semester, we talked a little bit about um, the characteristics of life. Um, some of those characteristics include being able to reproduce on your own, right? So replicate um, structures that look exactly like you um, all by yourself. Um, <clears throat> other uh, characteristics of life are that uh, you need to be able to metabolize on your own, right? So you need to be able to take in chemicals and convert them into usable forms using your own technology. And so um, these qualifications of life and others are not fulfilled by viruses. So they are not technically considered to be alive, but they are certainly biological entities. They evolve, right? We can actually map out phylogenies of viruses and how they have changed over time. I'll talk more about that here later, but um, in general, they can only reproduce. They can only um, exist with the help of living organisms. And okay, so we don't call these cells, they're acellular. We call them particles or virions. Um, so individual structures, an individual entity is called a particle or a virion. And so what exactly is a virus? If it's not alive, what exactly does it have? Um, well, it does not have um, organelles. Right? It is pretty much a capsule surrounding some kind of genetic material. And so these guys are um, incredibly diverse and um, resourceful when it comes to their genetic material. Um, they can use DNA or RNA. They can use single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA. Um, and the single-stranded RNA can be either the positive type or the negative type, so very diverse. But the thing is, they cannot express genes themselves um, that they contain within um, within their structures. Okay? Um, the genetic material, DNA or RNA, is protected from the outside world um, by a shell of proteins. These are called capsids, um, and oftentimes they include um, an extra layer um, of protection that is actually derived from the host cell's membrane. Okay, these viruses can come in a lot of different shapes. Um, and so uh, this one is probably the one that you're most familiar with, the influenza viruses. Um, we can see that their capsids have um, all sorts of little, um, what are called glycoproteins. So glyco for carbohydrate component, protein for a protein component. Um, and these are how viruses actually stick to their host cells and are taken into their host cells. Okay. Um, another uh, type that I want to point out um, are the bacteriophages, and we've talked a little bit about them before um, because bacteria can actually um, kind of mix up their genes, mix up their DNA um, using viruses in a lot of instances. And so uh, bacteriophages kind of look like little lunar landers. Um, 
right, we'll look at these in uh, just a minute here, but essentially their head um, is protected by the capsid. It uh, contains DNA. Um, the bacteriophage lands on the surface of the bacteria and actually injects its DNA inside the cell. So the, the virus itself isn't actually in the bacteria. Instead, it um, is just injected with this DNA. Um, one other thing on the slide, I do want to point out that viruses um, live everywhere on Earth that life is, um, and so they can infect any kind of organism. We're talking archaeans, bacteria, um, all forms of animals and protists, um, plants. Right. So here is um, a tobacco virus. Um, so every organism on Earth is susceptible to viruses. Okay, so a um, little bit more about uh, virus morphology. Um, the glycoproteins on the outside of the viruses um, are critically important in the attachment of the virus to its host cells. Um, the molecules themselves um, have physiological function, um, so that is, um, viruses have evolved um, to have complementary proteins on the surface of their cell that just happen to bind with receptors or proteins um, that are already in the host cell. Um, these particular uh, proteins you know, function in the organism for something else. It's not just you know, a docking station for viruses. Um, so for example, um, here we have um, a you know a C2 receptor um, that it is expressed on the surface of your endothelial cells, so the lining of your blood vessels, um, and so this it, you know, these um, receptors are important to the function of the human in this case, um, but the virus has just happened to um, evolve proteins on the surface of it to dock. Right, on the surface of the cell, and once it's docked, it can then be taken into the cell. Okay, so this particular example is um, a type, a subtype of herpes virus, um, so similar to Epstein-Barr, which causes mono, um, and uh, this particular virus can also um, kind of hijack the host cells to become cancerous. Right, we'll see that in just a second, how exactly that works. Um, but um, before we move on to that, um, I want to reiterate that viruses attach to proteins that are already on the surface of the organism's cells. Um, for the most part, viruses are species specific because the receptors of these um, surface proteins are specific to the species. However, um, a lot of viruses um, have evolved to um, be a little bit less specific, right? So just one tiny little mutation um, in a in the viral genome, right, can change the shape of the receptor in such a way that it can now bind to a similar receptor in another species, or it can bind to a similar receptor um, in another tissue, not just the blood vessels, but maybe now the lungs instead of just the the vessels. Um, and so, um, for the most part, viruses are species specific, right? A human virus isn't going to transfer to the, you know, your dog or your cat and vice versa. Um, however, um, as you guys are surely familiar at this point, um, there are instances of mutations that allow the viruses um, to bind to different receptors in different species. And so that's when we see um, viruses jump from just pigs, for example, just swine, into humans. So I want to spend a moment talking about the seasonal flu. Right? So not um, a pandemic, just the normal flu that you would, uh, or that many of us contract um, every winter. Um, all of the seasonal flu viruses are among the uh, influenza A family, as opposed to B or C. Um, all of these influenza A viruses can be classified um, based on two different types of proteins that are found on the surface of the virus. Um, so the H types and the N types. Um, and, and if you look down at the bottom of the slide, you can see um, 
portions of a couple tables that I borrowed from the CDC um, showing you um, you know the different proteins right and essentially where those proteins um, or whether or not those proteins are uh, expressed on the surface of viruses that have been found in birds or pigs or people or any other types of animals um, and so um, every season the uh, the flu all right that is most prominent for the particular flu season um, is a different variety right so it could be an age 17 and 10 age 18 and 11 etc etc um, and so uh, when vaccines are made uh, for the flu essentially um, scientists have to kind of predict what variety is going to be um, most prevalent um, you know a couple years into the future um, so they can develop vaccines um, against those particular things um, at this point I want to show you um, a clip from um, a clip showing you how influenza A uh, gets into your cells right? and also um, what some what a particular antiviral drug does to prevent its infection or at least reduce its infection um, and how our body can respond to the flu right? and actually make it um, a little bit less infectious in our cells. So enjoy. Everything begins when the virus enters our airways. Here, influenza virus is specifically attached to the surface of the epithelial cells. The viral membrane envelope contains the neurometadase protein Na, important for the efficient release of newly produced viruses. The M2 ion channel promotes viral structural changes during cellular entry, and the influenza hemagglutinin protein HA, the key player for viral internalization, which facilitates viral binding to sialic acid decorated receptors and subsequently viral fusion. Proteolytic cleavage by host enzymes is critical for the activation of the HA trimers. Soluble or cell-bound host proteases cleave the precursor HA molecules into two parts, HA1 and HA2. Influenza virus particles are internalized into early endosomes by clathrin-mediated endocytosis. In late endosomes, the pH drops, triggering the conformational change of the cleaved HA molecules. HA1 opens up and allows HA2 to form a triple alpha helix bundle, which extends towards the endosomal membrane. Once the fusion peptides are anchored in the endosomal membrane, the whole molecule can fold back, allowing the fusion of the viral and endosomal membranes. After fusion, the viral genome can be released into the cytosol. The eight viral RNA segments make their way into the cell nucleus and the production of the new virus begins. Just hours after the initial infection, thousands of new viruses butt off the cell surface and infect neighboring cells. To stop the influenza infection, through cell researchers have discovered fully human monoclonal antibodies capable of neutralizing the virus. These antibodies specifically bind to the HA and are internalized together with the virus. When the pH drops in late endosomes, the antibodies remain bound to a highly conserved epitope located in the stem of the HA. The antibodies now block the conformational change of HA, thereby preventing viral fusion and infection. The trapped virus degrades, leaving the cell unharmed. Some of Crucelle's new antibodies can also prevent the initial cleavage of HA. 
they bind to a highly conserved epitope close to the HA cleavage site, thereby preventing host proteases from activating the virus. The uncleaved virus is not infectious, so the cell and patient are safe. Crucelle's neutralizing antibodies prevent the spread of influenza infection and may save your life. All right, welcome back. Uh, now that we've seen how influenza A uh, can infect our cells um, or how we can kind of try to prevent it from infecting our cells, um, let's get into how exactly viruses function in a living cell, in their host's cell. So uh, in general, viruses can practice um, one or both of these types of life cycles. Uh, we'll start by talking about the lytic life cycle. Um, so lytic implying lysis, so bursting. Um, and so what we can see here is a bacteriophage, right? so specifically infecting bacteria. Um, their little lunar lander, as I said before, is going to attach to the surface of the bacterial cell um, by binding to some kind of specialized protein, right? So very much similar um, to other uh, viruses we've talked about. Um, these little lunar lander bacteriophages will then inject the DNA into the bacteria, right? At that point, the bacterial cells processes, right? So its life as it knew it is over, right? Essentially, the virus's DNA is going to hijack the bacterial mechanism. So the transcription, the translation, um, all of the bacteria's jobs are stopped. And instead, the bacteria is now going to dedicate the rest of its life, however short, to producing more virus. Right, and so as we can see here in this next step, um, the viral DNA, right, no longer the bacterial DNA, is going to be transcribed, translated, and it's going, or the bacteria is then going to make more and more of these little viruses, again, using its own technology. The virus does not have the technology um, to express genes. All it is is a capsule with genes inside. Okay. Um, once the new little viruses are produced, the bacteria's job is finished, right? And essentially, you're going to see lysis of the cell. So essentially, the bursting of the bacterial cell um, to release more of these little bacteriophages. And so then they can go forth and they can infect the next bacterial cell in the same way. Okay, so in the lytic life cycle, viruses completely hijack the life of the host cell. They use its mechanisms to make more and more viruses. And when enough viruses are produced and they're good to go, the cell bursts and releases those viruses out into the environment. Um, another type of life cycle um, is the lysogenic life cycle. Um, in the same way, the virus is going to attach, right? well, here you go, it's going to attach um, to the host cell. And instead of completely destroying the DNA of the host cell, it is actually going to incorporate its viral genome into the genome of, um, of the host cell. So this is like legit genetic engineering here. Um, we can see the viral DNA is part of the DNA of the host cell, okay? Um, essentially what this is doing is it is um, hijacking the host cell, um, not killing it, but essentially um, shifting its functions to do what the virus wants it to do. And so oftentimes these cells can become cancerous, right? So they're normal. Uh, regulatory mechanisms um, that, you know, complete apoptosis or, you know, controlled cell division, um, those mechanisms are going to be suppressed or eliminated so that the virus can keep on um, 
making more of these cells and therefore can spread its genome farther and farther throughout the host tissue. Right? So, um, you know, what we can see up here is making more and more of these cancerous cells. Right? So, um, an example of this um, or of a virus that works in this way is HPV or human papillomavirus. Um, this is a virus that is transmitted uh, sexually and when infected with this virus, right again, um, the viral genome is going to literally change the genome of your cells and your cells are going to keep on living, but um, in a cancerous way. So developing tumors um, and just completely uncontrolled. And so um, this is why HPV um, often leads to cervical cancer. Right, so the cervix of the uterus of a woman um, can become cancerous because of an infection by HPV. And of course, there is a vaccine for this. Um, Gardasil has been the, um, the name brand uh, for that particular uh, vaccine um, for a while now. Um, and so this vaccine, of course, um, trains your immune system to recognize HPV. And so as soon as HPV um, might be transmitted, uh, your B cells can release antibodies um, to inactivate that virus. And therefore, the cervical cells are not essentially genetically engineered, and therefore they do not become cancerous uh, for that reason. So um, certain viruses function in a lytic fashion, certain viruses function in a lysogenic fashion. Um, there are some that can kind of go back and forth depending on the environment. Um, so cold sores are an example of this. Um, so cold sores is, um, you know, those little sores that you get around, um, around your mouth. It is caused by a type of herpes virus. Um, and so generally, um, you know, when the when these cold sores are transmitted, um, they can exist in a lysogenic fashion for a while, right? So just like, you know, the genome is within the cells around your mouth, um, but then when you um, when your immune system is compromised, right? So maybe you're fighting um, a cold, the figure. Um, that is when these are uh, the this herpes virus actually shifts gears and it starts. Um, the lytic life cycle, right? So that's when the sores actually appear. Um, lots more of these viruses are being produced and released. Um, and so if you, um, you know, kiss somebody with these cold sores, that is how these uh, viruses can be transmitted to the next, um, the next host. Of course, then the virus would inject its DNA into the new host cells. And then um, that DNA is going to be um, part of the next host. Um, for the rest of their life, right? And again, um, the next time they are immunocompromised, they are fighting something else, um, cold sores appear, and the lytic phase or lytic life cycle is going to begin. Okay, so lytic and lysogenic. Um, one final note I want to make um, on this slide is that um, there are a variety of ways uh, that viruses can store their genetic material, right? Much, much more diverse than any actual living organism, um, which generally stores its genetic material as double-stranded DNA. Um, viral genomes, on the other hand, um, can be made out of DNA or RNA. Right? Like I said before, they can be linear or they can be circular, kind of like a bacteria's uh, DNA is circular, um, and they can be single-stranded DNA, they can be double-stranded DNA, or single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. Um, and so, and I mentioned this before, but it is really important um, because this will determine the behavior and how quickly the genetic material mutates and therefore um, how easily the virus spreads. One particular example of um, a class of viruses that I want to talk about are the retroviruses. Um, retroviruses um, include uh, famous viruses like HIV and feline leukemia. Um, and essentially what, the, uh, what these guys do is, you know, just like any other virus, they are going to attach to the host cells because they express on the surface um, of the virus 
particular glycoproteins that bind to receptors on the surface of the host cells. Right? So the same thing that we've talked about before. Um, essentially, the genetic material is dumped into the cell. Um, but the problem is this RNA of the retroviruses um, can't just be expressed by the cells, um, the cells enzymes, the cells ribosomes, right? And so um, normally in um, host cells, so in this case um, a human cell, um, usually DNA is transcribed into RNA and then that RNA is translated into the proteins. And so um, we can't just kind of skip that step. The viral RNA has to first be uh, copied into double-stranded DNA. And so as one of the very few um, tools that these retroviruses come with, um, reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that literally um, reverses the process of transcription. Right, so reverse transcriptase. Um, and uh, what it does is it takes this RNA, right? Usually RNA is the copy, but this time um, RNA is copied into double-stranded DNA. Um, so the same type of genetic material as is in the host cells. And this double-stranded DNA can then be literally glued with another, um, the second of its tools that this retrovirus comes with. Um, it can literally be glued into the host's genome so that um, this double-stranded DNA can be copied over and over and over and over again to make more and more and more of these viruses. And so you can't get rid of this, right? You can't just eliminate um, the genetic material once it is inserted within the genome, at least not at this point. Um, once it's part of your genome, it's always part of your genome. So, right, there is no cure necessarily for HIV. There's only um, treatments that you can give. Um, and so um, one of the ways of combating HIV is to inhibit this right here. All right, so reverse transcriptase um, is both what makes retroviruses so powerful um, and also it is what is essentially their Achilles heel. So we can attack this um, in order to dampen the effects of the virus. Okay, so um, no matter what type of virus you're talking about, um, viruses can replicate super quickly. Right? So for the most part, viruses only have a few genes. Right? So the flu virus might have like seven or eight genes, um, but of course it has some pretty profound effects uh, if you are the host and actually expressing those genes. Um, also, um, a host cell, um, particularly in the case of um, a lytic life cycle, um, a host cell can produce thousands of virions, so thousands of particles or individuals here, um, very quickly, right? So one cell making thousands of viruses, right? So very, very quickly. Um, and so this has allowed viruses to um, be very successful, right? Again, they are found in every place that life is found on Earth, um, regardless of how inhospitable um, you'd think it would be. Um, and the other thing is that um, this fast replication of viruses leaves a lot of room for errors. And in this case, uh, the viruses really use um, the errors to their advantage. Um, so there can be um, you know, mutation occurs fairly regularly when you're replicating DNA, but in our cells, we have proofreading mechanisms, right? We make sure that the DNA copy looks the same as the parent strand of DNA. Um, when RNA is replicated there, as I said, there is no proofreading mechanism. And so um, mutations can accumulate fairly rapidly, particularly in RNA-based viruses. And so um, influenza A, right, the flu virus, um, changes so much so quickly, um, and we can't just get one vaccine for any kind of flu. We have to keep making a new vaccine every year because influenza A and a lot of other single-stranded RNA uh, viruses can accumulate changes via antigenic drift. Right? So as you can see here, just accumulating little mutations, you know, one mutation here, one mutation there, but 
over a year, um, these mutations add up, of course. Um, but also, um, they can exhibit um, antigenic shift, right? So if they meet up with a different virus, they can actually combine genetic material, right? So just like we saw in bacteria, these guys can combine genetic material and produce very different um, proteins very quickly, right? And all it takes is one virus exposed to another virus and they can kind of mix and match, right? So lots of mutations means lots of evolution, right? Um, another example of this um, are the retroviruses, um, particularly HIV um, has the fastest um, evolution rate, right? So, um, you know, we can look over here um, in this graph, um, generally life, right? So bacteria in this case, and even uh, more so in um, plants, animals, fungi, um, but the mutation rate is a lot lower, right? Then compared to um, DNA, right? Uh, Double-stranded DNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, um, and um, we can see here retroviruses are have a particularly high mutation rate. And again, this is because they are RNA-based; they have this reverse transcriptase, um, so they accumulate mutations very quickly. Um, Particularly, the mutations in the reverse transcriptase enzyme um, is particularly high in HIV. And so, um, historically, um, AZT right, was the um, most, um, most commonly used treatment in HIV patients. Um, so that, of course, attacks um, or inhibits, anyway, uh, the reverse transcriptase enzyme. But because the reverse transcriptase enzyme keeps on mutating so quickly and these cells um, aren't killed uh, by the virus, um, it is the lysogenic cycle. Um, and so these cells just keep on making more and more and more of these enzymes um, that are different and different and different. And so people... Um, or the effectiveness of AZT declines very quickly in HIV patients. Um, and so um, actually treating HIV has um, been very challenging because of the unique characteristics of this retrovirus. And so um, the, uh, another virus I want to talk about, of course, is COVID-19. Um, this uh, is another term for this. So SARS, right, a uh, relative to the 2003 SARS outbreak, um, another form of coronavirus. Coronavirus has been around for a very long time in a variety of different organisms um, and of course has passed um, to humans um, in the past. Um, this is the second outbreak of a um, SARS uh, coronavirus type um, you know, in the last 20 years, um, but uh, I want to talk about um, its mechanism, right, and exactly what it is doing um, as far as we understand um, right now. Of course, this is a very um, rapidly evolving um, circumstance, and um, this is a novel or mutated form. Um, we cannot possibly predict um, all of its outcomes, all of its effects, um, but I do want to uh, just briefly talk about what exactly it's doing, um, the science of it, um, not getting into, you know, responses or politics or any of that kind of stuff. I just want to show you what exactly it is doing. Um, and so um, most of this information comes from um, an article uh, published very recently um, in science, um, so one of the most uh, prominent peer-reviewed journals in the world. Um, and so this is a review article summarizing the work being done by people around the world, um, perhaps the most reputable type of um, news that you could possibly um, get at this point. And so 
Um, I encourage you to read this article um, in more detail. Um, I am just, you know, grazing over the surface of what they know at this point. Okay, um, and so this SARS uh, coronavirus um, type two um, is a a type of severe acute respiratory syndrome um, virus. So it is, of course, causing um, severe respiratory issues. Um, but but how? Right now that we know a little bit more about viruses, what exactly is it doing? Well, we know um, at this point that coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, um, binds to what is called an ACE2 receptor on the surface of our cells. Um, and so just a tiny bit of background about ACE. Um, your body has a fairly complex mechanism of regulating its blood pressure, right? Blood pressure that's too high is going to burst your blood vessels and make your heart work really hard. Blood pressure that's too low means that your tissues are going to starve um, and not get enough oxygen. So maintaining your blood pressure is of critical importance to your body. And so um, one of the main organs that's responsible for regulating blood pressure is one that's very susceptible to any kind of shifts in blood pressure, and that is your kidneys. Right? So your kidneys can release a hormone uh, called renin. Um, this uh, renin molecule is going to convert um, a liver protein into angiotensin 1. Um, and Angiotensin 1 is not um, a very powerful hormone, but what is a powerful hormone in this entire process is angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 2 acts on your adrenal glands, it acts on your blood vessels, it acts on your brain. Like it, angiotensin 2 is really what is responsible for keeping your blood pressure um, up to where it needs to be. And so the way that we go from the kidneys um, releasing renin all the way to angiotensin 2 is by the angiotensin 1 in the blood is converted by an enzyme that is embedded within the tissues um, historically um, of the lungs. Okay, so again, in order to properly regulate your blood pressure, a protein in the blood is converted by enzymes embedded within the tissues of the lungs into angiotensin 2. Okay, and that enzyme is called ACE. Okay, so the fact that you or the fact that people are breathing in this virus, right, it is transmitted um, through the air. Right, the fact that you breathe in this virus into your lungs and the virus is then exposed to this ACE enzyme, right, so ACE2 specifically, um, in the lungs, that means that the virus is then able to be taken into the cells of the lungs. Right? And so all of the um, respiratory issues are associated with the fact that this is um, the primary place um, where the viruses are actually invading the cells. Um, and so if you've watched um, any part of the news, um, you might have heard that um, this virus is producing um, effects that maybe nobody really predicted, and it's very variable from person to person, from population to population. Um, and so I just want to elaborate a little bit about um, why we might be seeing some of these um, really um, you know, seemingly strange symptoms um, of, uh, of the virus. Right, and so um, ACE2, this receptor, is found, turns out, not only in the lungs, but in a lot of tissues in the body. And so in order to predict or explain anyway um, some of the effects of this illness um, is by looking for where the ACE2 receptors are actually found. Um, and so um, a lot of cardiovascular issues um, have been popping up in COVID patients. Um, and so turns out there are ACE2 receptors within the heart. Um, so the arrhythmias and the heart damage might be the virus um, actually binding to the receptors in the lining of the heart 
um, or in you know the lining of the blood vessels um, and again hijacking the cells normal behavior to produce more viruses um, another um, another thing that has been um, very prevalent um, is kidney issues right so um, the many of the patient many coven patients um, with underlying kidney issues are having kidney failure even people without underlying kidney issues um, are developing kidney issues um, once they have contracted COVID um, and so uh, once again uh, there are ACE2 receptors within the kidneys um, many of these patients um, you know have been found to have viral particles um, in their kidneys and um, kidney breakdown and so um, dialysis machines have also been in um, high demand in addition to respirators um, there are ACE2 receptors in your nervous tissue right so specifically in the neural cortex so the outside of your brain responsible for actual thinking um, as well as your brain stem which is responsible for regulating all of the very basic functions of life right so beating of your heart the breathing um, etc um, and so uh, many COVID patients have also um, contracted meningitis um, so inflammation of the coverings on the outside of your nervous system um, encephalitis so inflammation of the brain itself seizures um, other neurological issues um, and so um, tests in some patients have shown that uh, the virus can make it into your cerebrospinal fluid and therefore be circulated throughout your nervous system as well um, and also the cousin of COVID-19 so the uh, 2003 SARS outbreak um, was shown to infiltrate neurons as well um, ACE2 receptors are also found in the GI tract um, and so one of the symptoms that is beginning to arise more and more is diarrhea um, and so um, in stool samples of COVID patients there have also been found um, capsid proteins so the shell on the outside of the virus um, it's been found in the stool and so it's very likely that the virus is not only confined to the lungs it's not only confined to the heart or the kidneys um, but also um, the digestive tract as well okay um, so um, again uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of background about why uh, some of these symptoms are showing up um, it seems like it's just a respiratory issue but um, many patients are experiencing other complications likely linked to the ACE2 receptor uh, where, where they're found uh, another um, another factor in this and kind of exacerbating all of these issues combined um, is something called a cytokine storm um, earlier in this talk I told you about um, how the body or certain cells like mast cells release um, chemicals into the blood that are called cytokines and these cytokines um, ramp up the inflammatory response they ramp up the um, production of different um, innate immune system cells um, and so um, what is also most likely occurring in COVID patients is that um, because this is a strain of virus that humans have not seen before it is recently mutated um, the body just doesn't really know how to respond entirely um, that is there is no immunological memory um, it is spreading very quickly throughout the body and so the body tries to you know take out that sledgehammer and beat it away um, as much and as strongly as possible in a really imprecise way and so um, if you have underlying blood pressure issues or kidney issues uh, which of course are tied back to blood pressure issues um, diabetes even um, what these what this excess of cytokines might lead to um, are additional issues or again exacerbation of those symptoms um, that you're already experiencing um, at the bottom here um, just want to point out that uh, this is an image taken from the CDC website that is um, you know 
pointing out that they remember the 1918 flu pandemic, um, the Spanish flu, which is not a SARS uh, flu, but a lot of um, the same responses are being taken. Um, and so we can learn a lot from looking at previous pandemics um, and when transmission rates increased and decreased and what happened to people with that. Um, one final note about COVID. Um, this uh, virus, again, has been around for a very long time. Um, even a cousin of it has been found in people not even that long ago. Um, but this is particularly troublesome, not only because no one is immune yet, right? We have not been exposed to this form of the virus before, and so we have no memory of it. Um, but because these particular mutations have both increased the transmission rate, right? So it has spread much farther, much faster to more people um, than its cousins. Um, and also, um, it has an increased affinity for binding to those receptors. And so it takes less of the virus to actually um, infect a person um, because it is going to bind with high specificity um, and tightly to any of those ACE2 receptors in your body. And so again, these ACE2 receptors are in your respiratory system, right? Starting even in your nasal cavity. So as soon as it's in your nose, these guys can bind in your blood vessels, in your kidneys, in your liver, all of these different organs that we are seeing um, effects in patients today. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about the specific characteristics, um, a peer-reviewed article that I can point out, um, therefore reputable, written by actual scientists who know about this, um, the link is down below. And so, I want to recognize the profound impact that viruses are having on the human species, on our world, and on all of life um, as pathogens um, now and throughout the history of life on Earth. Um, but I do also want to point out that viruses are not all the enemy that we um, and all life on Earth have co-evolved with viruses um, since the beginning of life, most likely. Um, and that some viruses are actually very beneficial um, to us. And so one example of this um, are the um, cyanobacteria. As we've discussed before, the cyanobacteria are really important um, in the ocean ecosystem as the primary producers um, of the ecosystem, but also they are producing um, about 50% of the oxygen that is available for us to breathe, even not in the ocean. Um, so, of course, photosynthesis in these creatures is uh, important to us all. Um, and so, uh, just like in plants, uh, UV rays, right, the intensity of the sun, can damage organisms, right? Any organism on Earth can be damaged by the sun. Um, and so cyanobacteria are no exception to this. Um, when the sun becomes too intense, photosynthesis is actually impaired. And so cyanobacteria actually gain um, photosynthetic ability when they are infected by a virus. And so a virus that most commonly infects the cyanobacteria actually contains genes for proteins that are found in photosystem 2. So one mechanism of photosynthesis in the cyanobacteria. Um, and so when the cyanobacteria is infected with this virus, its genes are expressed by the bacteria and then the bacteria can continue photosynthesis even in less than optimal conditions. And so it's actually beneficial for the bacteria to be infected by the virus and so they don't fight infection by the virus. Also, it is beneficial to the virus to contribute to photosynthesis because the more photosynthesis that exists or is occurring, the more 
energy is available in the cyanobacteria to make more viruses to go forth and to infect other cyanobacteria. And so this is actually a, a pretty wild symbiotic relationship um, between a virus and a living organism. Um, next, the human virome. So we've talked a little bit about the microbiome, about the gut flora um, that sustain the epithelial lining and your GI tract and so on and so forth. Um, among the bacteria are also viruses and it turns out the viruses um, that are living in our gut um, also are helping us to be healthy. Um, and one, um, one way they do this is um, we have bacteriophages within our gut um, that actually um, see so here's a bacteriophage right here um, they can actually stick their little capsule down in the mucus and stick the legs up and so um, pathogenic bacteria that are trying to invade our cells um, actually you know are kind of approaching right here Right? And the virus actually sticks right to the surface of the pathogenic bacteria, so it doesn't even have a chance to remotely approach our cells. And so um, viruses aren't only there to infect our cells and use us as hosts, but we can sustain bacteriophages to eliminate bacteria that would otherwise be trying to invade our tissues as well. Um, so still a lot, of, um, a lot of work to be done on the human virome. Um, final point um, about uh, humans and viruses um, is that if you compare our DNA to the genomes of uh, many viruses, um, turns out about 8% of our DNA is actually derived from viruses. <laughs> um, and uh, some of these genes um, have actually become very important in our evolution. Um, for example, certain retroviruses um, contain genes that essentially um, inhibit the host cells from um, essentially attacking the virus, right? So essentially promoting their longevity by um, suppressing the immune response against the virus, right? So very helpful for the retrovirus, but it turns out that mammals in particular have used these viral genes, right? It's a retrovirus, so it sticks its genes into our genome. Um, turns out that the genes, the very same genes that are suppressing our immune system to get rid of particular viruses, we can also use to suppress um, a pregnant mother's immune system um, so that she does not attack, um, you know, produce an immune response against her child. Right? Think about the fact that um, a pregnant mother has a non-self organism inside it, right? Normally we would um, attack this non-self thing, right? Genetically different, not expressing our same MHCs on the surface of the cells. We would attack this organism um, to eliminate it from the body, right? Um, however, these viral genes are critically important in not allowing that to happen. It's right? so very important in the evolution of mammals. And finally, I want to end today um, by talking um, or just mentioning the fact that um, viruses are used for what is called gene therapy. Right? The fact that they can inject genes into um, an existing living cell's genome means that um, if we can harness this ability, we can actually specifically inject genes into damaged tissues in the human body or in other organisms. Um, so for example, um, cystic fibrosis right, is a result of one single mutated gene. And so if we can inject the non-mutated copy of a gene into living cells, maybe we can eradicate the symptoms of cystic fibrosis or any other type of genetic abnormality. And so viruses are being used um, developed as gene therapy. Um, also, um, there is some uh, attention um, on bacteriophages and being used um, as part of vaccines. I'm still very early on in this process, but um, definitely a promising type of technology.
And so in conclusion, um, our immune system is divided into innate and adaptive responses. The adaptive responses remember what has been infected or what has infected the body in the past and can launch a strong, specific, immediate response um, against these pathogens when they see them again. One type of pathogen are the viruses. And the viruses, um, even though um, we know mostly about the pathogenic forms, viruses can also be very helpful in our evolution as well as in our um, medicine. Thanks for listening.